PF Sense 2.5.0 development. Now this is not released yet. This is a development version like I'm pointing out here. Also, I don't know the date it's going to be released. So we can just, you know, you can leave that a question if you want. I don't know. Uh, they don't do it based on a time date as much as when they feel there's enough features and all the little bugs are quashed, they then push it to production. They are not a company that works under the terms of move it, move fast, break fast uh, type thing because, well, we certainly don't want that with our firewalls. So I do appreciate their more methodical development methods, which may take longer, but, you know, I'd rather have a bug-free firewall experience, uh, especially because, well, it's a firewall. Back to the 2.5 version. So I'm not running this in production. I'm probably going to move it uh, as it seems to be stable enough that I'll start using it at home. Because, um, you know, worst case at home, I disrupt a few uh, Netflix shows my wife is watching or something like that. But we do have a lot of lists of new features. And we'll get to those in a second. Because first, this is how open source development works. One, it's done in the public. It's open to the community. So you can download development version. You can see it in action being developed and they have an entire process to reporting issues with pfsense software so there are methodologies by which they have a guide for to help you follow how the development process is going and this doesn't just count for the beta this also counts for if you want to participate or assist in you know quashing bug reports uh this is the way things get fixed they do not get fixed by you ranting and saying this product is terrible because it doesn't support a certain thing or it crashes under a certain condition. If you're not helping to document that condition, you're not really contributing back the open source uh, software. So they have an entire process by which to commit uh, changes and things like that. They have a subreddit and a forum, and they do admit that they use Redmine, and Redmine is not a discussion forum. That's why this is highlighted. It is not a discussion platform where people for support. So first, make sure you are very familiar with PFSense, and then if you do find an issue or find a bug or find a, a scenario, then work with part of the community to help fix that because it benefits all of us. All right, I'll leave links to this so you can read through it. PFSense 2.5 new features and changes. It's a major OS version upgrade, OpenSSL upgrade, PHP and Python upgrade. So there's a lot of underlying that's different, but interface wise, it's going to be pretty much the same. Uh, this is the 2.5 development version and it doesn't look much different, but for the noted changes. The first thing that this is just something that no matter uh, how many blog posts or putting it at the very top as a warning message, people still ask me this question at like every turn. I thought it required AES and I. Also, AES and I has been around for like, I don't know, eight or nine years, I think. Uh, so processors if have been around with this feature for a very long time. So I don't know why people made such a massive big deal that sometime there may be a requirement of AES and I uh, in the processor. But I guess people like running really old hardware that's older than that old, et cetera. But they have assured everyone it does not required. AES and I is not a required feature to run PF Sense 2.5. So let's get that out of the way and that way it'll wash those questions or maybe some people are just here to talk about that. Um, operating system architecture, like I said, 12, OpenSSL upgraded. Um, and there is a note about the OpenSSL upgrades because there's some differences in the later versions. Some things that rely on OpenSSL may have some problems in terms of some of the plugins while this is in beta. And they're, you know, this is all stuff that they're working on to fix. Um, so security rata, relay D does not function. Relay D BSD port has changed to require Libre SSL. There's no apparent sign of work to make it compatible with OpenSSL. The HA proxy may still be used in its place, but it is more as it is much more robust and complete than the load balancer. So uh, they're deprecating that and you know, folks on HA proxy, which eventually I do want to do a video on. Uh, known issues. This is that open SSL warning. Um, and now let's dive into some of the cool features that are in here. Uh, there's a little bit of changes to free radius, which is cool. Uh, fixed URL based storing uh, last most entry list in the configuration. Fixed issue with PF tables remaining active after they have been deleted. Um, so there's a little bug quashing going on there. Backup restore, some updates there. Uh, better, you know, because it's going to use a new OpenSSL, so uh, stronger encryption there. This is where I wanted to start, though, in terms of features that I thought was really interesting is the captive portal. This uh, particular feature that my client was really excited about. Um, because of the quantity of users. I think he's several thousand users, if I'm not mistaken, around his system. And with Captive Portal, he used it to authenticate and set different speeds based on um, usernames and passwords and manage the internet for these people. Uh, when you're doing that, one of the problems you run into is, let me scroll down right here. 
and it's preserve user database across reboots. So when you have a thousand people and they log in and then they have to log in again because you updated the firewall to well, when a new version comes out or uh, a power out, an extended power outage and all those people start calling you saying, hey, I forgot what my login and password was, et cetera, et cetera. Generally people, they're end users, they want to authenticate once. It's like an apartment complex essentially. And uh, the way you manage it with the captive portal, so not everyone just gets internet. You have to have some type of password combination that they can uh, offer or revoke, but also ex if you reboot, it would revoke all those. Again, they just have to do the portal login page because they like persistent logins. Now that can be preserved across reboot. So that to me is a big feature change. There's a lot of other little things updated in there, but that particular one is nice. They've added a lot of features to the way uh, certificates work, so there's a lot of a rat on that, which is good. There's, uh, I haven't done a video yet on this, but I plan to because the Acme system is one of the plugins you can get, so you can use Let's Encrypt Search with a variety of different DNS providers. And then if you're doing something combining like Captive Portal, for example, with a Let's Encrypt Search, then you are able at that time to manage a HTTPS, a TLS connection to Captive Portal with a valid certificate. and uh, like I said, they've been a lot of little handling of making that a lot better. That's definitely much improved there. DHCP, fixed handling of DHCP, lease host names, some minor changes there. Uh, diagnostics, added reboot file system checked options from the GUI page. Now, this is previously something that you can do from the command line. You could say reboot and check, but now we go over here to diagnostics, reboot, and we can say normal reboot or file system check. So definitely neat. Um, I like the fact that they added it there. That way I don't have to go to the command line if I wanted to just to go ahead and do a file system check on reboot. Um, sometimes there's needs for that. Dynamic DNS updates. The very cool there. Added support for uh, Gandhi Live DNS, Dynamic DNS. Now people ask me a lot of questions about this and I just don't have experience with PPOE connections or just not used very much with any of my clients that we currently have or generally in America I don't see them but it seems like whenever I get requests it's from someone overseas where it seems to be more prevalent um, so it sounds like they do understand there's some issues with VLANing and PPOE I know people had this question that comes up about the way they split the uh, WAN VLAN with a PPOE pass through it's something apparently some of the carriers do I haven't run into this, so I'm not versed in it, but they are working on it. So hopefully that does quash whatever problem you may have been experiencing with it, even though I'm not sure what that problem is. Uh, lots of little updates and changes updating to uh, IPsec. So added more support. So uh, added a 25.519 curve face IPsec, um, Diffie Hellman and PF Sense Company, it's Diffie Hellman DH in uh, PFS groups. Uh, enable Strong Swan. And fixed IPsec configuration generation and encryption options for every P2 and a given P1 are not duplicated. So a lot of minor changes here, but uh, those are important. Now, this is another one where I'll stay, I'm pretty excited about is change logging system to plain text and log rotation. So the old binary clog format has been deprecated. I just like X logs, I'm partial to them. Uh, people have asked me about this before. And um, I mean, clog is okay, binary logs are okay. They, they have some use cases, but um, they're being deprecated in PFSense, so cool. And let me show you what it looks like now because they actually changed it a little bit. We do have a GUI service and OS boot in here now. And we, over here on the log settings, scroll down, you have the ability to log rotation of bytes, log compression types, none, Z standard, GZIP, BZIP2, log rotation counter. So it's going to give them your standard dot uh, TGZ or however you want to rename them. I think this is kind of cool. So you can have a series of compressed logs um, and there's a lot of different tools that can help handle that. Uh, and it, it's just a more common log format that I'm very used to. And, you know, this is great that they added this into the system here. Um, notifications, deprecate and remove ground notifications, uh, added uh, a daily certificate Expiration notification settings and controls for that behavior, cool. Uh, added GUI options for uh, NP sync poll intervals. But here's another one where there's definitely a lot of more updates. And let's actually take a look at that. So if we go over here to VPN, open VPN, I set up just a dummy VPN. And one of the things they did, and I have solved some problems for people, you can't cross the pools now. <laughs> don't cross the streams and don't cross the pools. IPv4 tunnel network. Uh, the tunnel network was you're able to actually start reusing it and it would break things and i've had to troubleshoot for people when the only problem they had was that they use the same tunnel network twice on two different open vpn instances they couldn't figure out why things aren't working 
Now they actually have that as a feature where it stops to check that to save you from yourself. Um, so in this particular bug here, we can look at it and you can see right here, uh, lots of newbies just paste in <laughs> as the tunnel network on their OpenVPN instances. This comes from an example set up somewhere. Um, and it's funny because I, I actually see that a lot when people follow some of mine and they'll just paste in exactly uh, this, the 70 20 slash 24, because they copy one of my demos and then they'll make two of them. So yes, this is definitely, and by the way, it's kind of fun reading through all these comments on each of these to see um, the changes in action and the discussion around them. So uh, works as expected, exact matches are rejected, etc. cetera. So uh, definitely pretty cool here that they've added that as a feature. Hopefully it'll save some people that are trying to set this up some uh, headache and troubleshooting because they'll say, oh, I've reused that same tunnel network before. Um, add exit notify to open VPN servers and clients. And what does exit notify mean? That is the ping setting. So you can actually uh, go in here and when it drops or uh, causes open VPN after n seconds to, of an activity to go ahead and drop them off if you wanted to force log people out. That is something you can do here. And they've added all the menu options for it. Now, this is one of the cool things about PFSense is these a lot of times are like custom parameters you can pass to uh, OpenVPN as they update it. But one of the nice things about PFSense is that they expose so much in the UI, but then still leave you the option to if you ever had those extra parameters. So for those of you that wanted that feature, it's now there, once again, through some of the suggestions that come across. Uh, routing, RAID. Enable RAID X MPATH kernel option for multipath routing. Fix automatic stagger routes set for DNS gateway bindings not being removed and no longer necessary. Uh, that is something that I think I've covered in my dual WAN videos or failover WAN videos where there's some issues there where you have to make sure you have a DNS and set to each of the WANs. Uh, I believe it's all fixed now in this. There's, it's an edge case if you have certain uh, configurations. Uh, fixed issues with checking updates to the GUI proxy authentication. Cool. Created separate auto uh, UFS UFI and auto UFS BIOS installation up to avoid problems on hardware that boots differently and USB and non-USB disks. Yeah, UFI sometimes has problem with that. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of UFI, but it's here, whatever. Uh, maybe I'm just old, but it just has some pain in the butt things that can be annoying and it seems to always take longer to boot. Uh, increase the number of colors available in the login screen. Okay. <laughs> These are those really minor things that happen. That, uh, cool. Uh, fixed empty lines in various forms throughout the UI. These are all those little things that I really like because, um, you know, it's always nice to see some visual enhancements on there. I don't want it to be a completely different interface because, well, we like our firewalls being similar, so I know where things are. Um, but it's little things like I noticed a couple lines of forms are caused by using add input instead of uh, add global. These are some of those little things where uh, open source communities really that little bit of feedback of not just being able to say, hey, there's too many lines in it, but actually suggesting to them and giving the developers the feedback going, hey, we see this. And if you did this instead, it'd be more efficient Then the developer can validate that thought uh, as a discussion in here and um, push it down to be closed. And away you go with a pull request. So I think that's actually pretty cool that, you know, all this is being done. So. That's pretty much it. Like it's not, it is some significant under the hood. It's not significant in terms of uh, interface, like I said. So things are pretty much in the same place as they were. Oh, I did gloss over one thing, but I will go back to it. If you're doing packet capture, status, uh, actually it's under diagnostics, packet capture. And you want to do the packet capture. Now you have a few more options of host, host address and port number. So now you can do your packet capture and narrow it down to a port. Now, this is very helpful when you want to do larger packet captures. Uh, you may have limited amounts of space on your system or just because you know what port the target data is going to be on that you're looking for. So you narrow it down to port. You just get a smaller capture file and there's less to sort out when you're using like Wireshark, for example, to sort out those packets and figure things out and how it's working. So very cool that they added this as a port option and um, who knows what else they, what more little things that will be done before this reaches full development uh, and becomes a release. But I'll leave a link to this on how to reboot bug reporting. And like I said, this applies to current stable uh, production version and beta versions for in terms of, you know, how you report issues to PFSense. Feel free to read through all these discussions and you can get, you know, some wonderful insight that you don't get in closed source software as to the reasons why they did things. Some 
People always, you know, rattle the cage and shake their hands in anger. I don't know why they did it this way. Well, a lot of times in open source, that's the best part is there's an explanation for why they did something this way. Um, and, you know, it's all done in the clear. It's all done in the open. So we know why it was developed. We know how it was developed. And we can look at the code as it's being developed. All right, I'll leave links to all this so you can do some further reading. Um, but if you have the ability to do some testing and help, you know, uh, what the open source development is, that would be awesome. And uh, go ahead and check it out. It's free to download. All right, thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.